This is how a formerly enslaved woman became the first person in Massachusetts to fight for reparations and win. Almost. Belinda Sutton lived here at the Royal House, in what is now the city of Medford, just outside Boston. 200 years ago, this was a sprawling plantation. She was among the dozens of enslaved people who labored here. 50 years, her faithful hands have been compelled to ignoble servitude for the benefit of an Isaac Royal, until the terror of men armed in the cause of freedom compelled her master to fly. I mean, what an amazing passage, right? Historian Kiara Singleton showed me the original petition Belinda Sutton filed. It's quite amazing. I mean, we do not have many documents like this from Black women in the 18th century. Belinda Sutton filed the petition after becoming emancipated from her enslaver's estate in 1783. She starts with talking about where she grew up, which um, we have come to uh, understand that that's modern Ghana. Belinda Sutton is making it very clear that not only does she have a homeland, but she had a family, and slavery was the reason why she was taken away from both her home and her family. So what we can think about is that she is a part of this active, rich, black abolitionist and radical black community who are at the front lines of of not only demanding for their freedom, but also demanding for the freedom of all black people in the state of Massachusetts. What can you tell me about the process Belinda went through to petition? What we do know is that Belinda Sutton is illiterate, and we know that because she signs her petition with an X. She would have dictated her story, and then she would have filed it with the Massachusetts legislature. And the court says, we agree with you. We do think you deserve um, to be compensated. But Singleton believes the legislature only approved Belinda Sutton's petition for reparations to punish the royal family for picking the wrong side in the Revolutionary War. I want to be very clear that that legislature is not saying, yes, we are actively and, and willingly wanting to give money to this 70-year-old black woman just out of the kindness of their heart. What they're doing is saying, there's a new government in town and the royals were loyalists. She was enslaved by one of the wealthiest enslavers in all of New England. And so it really is a way for them to try to punish people like the royals. So the legislature gives her an annual settlement of 15 pounds um, and 12 uh, shillings, which is supposed to help her survive and take care of a daughter who, sh who is sick. She gets that payment only twice. While it is important that she wins that judgment, it's even more important that she doesn't get all of that money and that she keeps fighting back for that money because she needs it, but also because she's owed it. But what it does, it shows us the ways in which black people are putting pressure on you know, the government, on elected officials to actually live up to the promises of freedom. Particularly because when we think about New England and the height of the transatlantic slave trade, people are talking about the abolitionist movement. That means that there's a lot of white help and white advocacy. But Belinda, I think, is a testament to black people doing their own thing. Yeah, black people have always been their own abolitionists. And generally we have tol told the story of abolitionists through white judges and lawyers um, and activists. But black people have always been at the center of that movement as well. So when we say that this document helps us understand reparations, I think it really does uh, do the work that so many people are grappling with today. How does, in Belinda's case, slavery, but then today, a long history of structural racism and inequality um, prevent uh, black people from being able um, to determine their own lives and livelihood? Belinda Sutton's cause lives on, and in 2024, there are many different questions about reparations. I did a whole podcast about it. It's called What is Owed? You can find it here.